We will now call the meeting of the Waco City Council on April 20th, 2021 to order at two o'clock. Joining me today are Mayor Pro Tem Hector Sabido, Council Member Andrea Bearfield, Council Member Josh Porterud, Council Member Kelly Palmer, and Council Member Jim Holmes. City staff also online today are Bradley Ford, our City Manager, Jennifer Ritchie, our City Attorney, and Esmeralda Hudson, our City Secretary. We'll now pause for a moment of silence. Thank you. On March 16th, 2020, the governor suspended various provisions of the Open Meetings Act pursuant to a state of disaster authority. The changes were effective March 16th, 2020 until further notice or until the state of disaster declaration expires. In accordance with physical distancing guidelines and while providing for as much transparency as possible, this meeting will not be open to the public attending in person. This meeting is being broadcast live on WCCC.TV. The audio is also being recorded. The, the video and audio recordings will be made available to the public. According to the governor and attorney general, statutes that may require face-to-face -face interaction between members of the public and public officials are suspended, provided, however, that the governmental body offers alternative methods of communications with their public officials. This includes public comment on agenda items. In an effort to allow for as much public input as possible, those who wish to speak or submit their written comments on a, logist, on a listed agenda item were asked to register with the city secretary's office by noon today. Individuals who register to speak on an agenda item must limit their comments to three minutes. On items other than public hearings, speakers will be allotted one three minute presentation regardless of the number of agenda items the speaker wishes to address. We will now recess the regular session and convene the work session with a report from our city manager, Bradley Ford. Brad. Aaron, good afternoon, council members. We, um, we have no changes to the agenda this afternoon. And I have one pretty simple employee recognition that I wanted to provide. I really wanted to start the meeting by just saying a big thank you uh, to each of the city staff members that were involved in the parade last week. You know, that, that effort really takes a lot of different departments, you know, in conjunction with Baylor Athletics. And our Parks and Rec team did an amazing job just coordinating and planning. And their crews, uh, as you might imagine, showed up 6.30 a.m. on parade day and stayed well into the evening hours. And, and we're even back the next day ensuring that uh, there wasn't very much proof at all that the parade had even taken place. Perhaps the only real proof being the, the green water that was still in the fountains in front of City Hall. But obviously parks, you know, can't put on an event like that without the help of others. So I want to say particular thanks to uh, Esmeralda uh, and her team in the city secretary's office for coordinating several pieces of this parade, as well as uh, other groups like police and fire, public works, municipal information, and city attorney's office for really putting on just a, a fabulous event here in Waco. Our, uh, on our agenda today, we do have uh, four informal reports. Um, of course, the first is our, our typical update on COVID-19. We also have IR's informal reports on the winter storm recovery efforts, McLennan County Emergency Rental Assistance Program, and lastly, our, an update on outdoor permitting and city events coming soon. I take any questions on the informal reports this time. City Manager Ford, thank you so much. And I would like to reiterate first and foremost, your sentiments about the Baylor Parade and all of the teamwork that went into putting on such a great event. Um, it was wonderful to see how the city of Waco came together to just commemorate and celebrate the national championship of the men's basketball team, but also wonderful to see the community of Waco and, and people just come on and cheer on our Baylor Bears. So I have to say that staff pulled it off without a hitch um, it was easy, it was fun, so many great responses we heard on them. Um, and I say easy, not knowing the work that staff put into it. Let me, tell, let me, let me say that. Um, but, but I also know that, that the staff worked very, very hard uh, to make such a great uh, parade happen and that just the Bears celebrated the way they deserve. And so I just wanna thank you uh, and, and all of the staff for, for, for doing that. I do have uh, a few questions about some of the IRs, and I would like to start off with um, IR, uh, the, the health informal report. And I just want to make sure I'm reading this correctly, but the bottom graph where it breaks down the percentages of race based on the health district, McLennan County in Texas, am I reading this correctly to assume that 
uh, for example, let's take the first line, 15.4% 15 15 of the vaccinations that have been given out of the McLennan County hub are of Hispanic descent. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, sir. Okay. And then in McLennan County, that's all of our vaccination uh, clinics or hubs that 13.76 have gone to um, Hispanic of any race. And that does not over that does not overlap with the health district. So these are completely separate numbers. Go ahead, Lashonda. I see you join us uh, for the public that doesn't know Lashonda Marley Horn is our director of public health who's joined the call. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, so we don't, just a clarification. So yeah, those are two different numbers. The first number is just based on what we have done in house, and the second number is aggregate information across the county. So our, our percentage rate of Hispanics being immunized at this point is at a, on a higher pace than the county as a whole. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that's really why I wanted to make sure that the numbers were duplicated because I really want to uh, applaud the efforts by our health district. I know that uh, since we began these vaccination clinics, we uh, council has been very vocal for lack of better words to make sure that our, our our immunizations are done in an equitable manner of COVID-19 and to see this type of response and how the health district is responding and making the desires and goals and wants of, of council come to fruition I really appreciate that so uh Miss Mar Marley Horn thank you so much for your your commitment and your dedication and making sure that we continue our efforts and making sure that our COVID-19 vaccinations are done in an equitable manner. So I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind words. Our staff are working very hard. Um, Hector, I'm going to follow you on this one. Yes, I know sir. you want to say something about the other IRs, but I'll, Go for I've it. got just a couple of comments on this one too. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Ms. Mallory Horn, on the this. I love uh, anything that can get in concisely into a page or two pages. I love this format because it gives you nice updates on Cases, admission, hospital admissions, fatalities, positivity rates, just all right here. And coupled with the uh, city's uh, COVID website, I think this is, we're getting good information back to the citizens. So I just want to applaud you on the communication effort that I've seen. And along the lines of what uh, uh, Mayor Pertem Sabido uh, mentioned, just the effort that we made early on on getting equitable uh, shots uh to to uh the community uh, you can just you can see it right here in that that little uh table that we did make improvements looks like we still have ways to go but we're going in the right direction appreciate thank your efforts you. thank you so much hector i'm gonna let you lead do the next hour i'll, 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 <laughs> I'll fall in behind you on the next one thank you sir uh thank you also for the ir217 um, and, and I do appreciate the update on FEMA as we are still navigating through uh, was probably one of the or the worst winter storm that Waco and McLennan County has seen <laughs> um, in, in, in years. Uh, and, and I see Assistant City Manager Holt on the line. I just want to make sure that I'm reading this correctly, sir. So by the report, am I to... Uh, it is stated, and I'm going to make sure I'm reading this correctly, that the that the necessary work is estimated at $3 million for the county and the city as a whole, correct? That's correct, yes, sir. And then the emergency repair estimation is 1.79 for the city and the county as well. Yes, that is correct. Okay. But at this time, uh, only FEMA has only approved Category B right. reimbursements. Right. So there's still all these other pocket or these opportunities to get more reimbursements. And that's why we are also partnering with a consultant to make sure that we are taking every opportunity that we can to try to get reimbursed on the expenses that we had from the winter storm. Yeah, absolutely, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, this, this emergency was a little different in that FEMA came out immediately while the, the actual emergency was going on and authorized that category B. It seems a little weird because normally in these emergencies, what they do is they wait till the emergency is over and everybody submits all their possible expenditures before they start opening up categories. So what you're seeing is that everybody's submitting all the category B stuff, but they're also submitting all those things in the other six categories. And we submit that to FEMA in hopes that they'll open up those other categories when they see all the jurisdictions have expenditures in those categories. 
And one of the really beneficial things of engaging uh, the consultants that we have is that they're familiar with our accounting system, our Tyler accounting system. They can get in there and they're also really familiar with the FEMA process. It's very um, complicated and time consuming. And because of their familiarity with that process, they may help us identify expenses that, that we might not have submitted otherwise because of their familiarity with both the processes and the people at FEMA. And so it's, it's really to help us be um, as, as um, effective as we can in getting all the reimbursement that we can in, all, in, in any categories that they open up for us. Wonderful. Well, I, I just um, thank you for that because I think it's important and imperative that we are looking at um, how the assistance that we could get help from FEMA uh, as much as possible. I think I, I really do appreciate that as we know that uh, on top of COVID, then the winter storm came and it really put an impact, a fiscal impact, I should say, in our city, in our community. And so I really want to thank you for your leadership in this and making sure that we are doing everything that we can to try to apply and have access to all of the assistance that we can. So thank you for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is Holmes. I'll just follow it up right quick, uh, Hector. Um, but I just wanted to clarify, I think I know the answer to this question, but yeah, we identified the roughly three and a half, three, seven of ex extraordinary sort of expenses that we took in response to the winter storm. We're seeing some other federal programs come out uh, and kind of undefined yet, like uh, the, uh, the ARP and this infrastructure. Um, and, and if you could clarify that FEMA, this is a very clear path, FEMA is a dedicated uh, it kind of stands alone. It's not going to wait to see what happens with ARP or infrastructure or some of these other things we're hearing about. And, and uh, uh, Ryan or, or whoever wants to comment on that, just I just want to hear that confirmation. Yeah, absolutely. The FEMA process is actually created by statute, federal statute. And so there's a very narrow process. Um, the Even the processes of them uh, opening up certain categories, certain thresholds, monetary thresholds have to be met by each jurisdiction for them to even consider opening up those those different categories. And I included a description of all those categories in this uh, as an attachment to this item. Um, and so some things, just to give you an example, some things that we may have considered an emergency repair, they may not consider as necessary under category B. And so that's where having that help from the, uh, the consultants uh, will really help us fine tune our request in each of the uh, seven categories. Uh, because while to you and I, it may seem like an emergency to get uh, water repair done to FEMA, that might not have been an emergency repair under category B. Um, and so all of that stuff is outlined in, in federal statute and uh, we follow that very, very carefully. Thanks, Ryan. Um, just quickly, uh, ACM Hope, is the, the the monies that we get, is this just reactive or can some of it be used proactively in a manner that, you know, so if we weren't, you know, as we were caught unaware, so are there things that we can do to aid in preparedness or is this just to repair? Right. So uh, Proactive measures, so long as they are narrowly scoped, can be submitted to FEMA. That's one of the reasons why doing an after action review is so yes. important, not only for, you know, so that we can do a better job of responding to emergencies, but also mm -hmm. identify those things that can create resiliency uh, mm -hmm. within our systems uh, so that maybe we, we don't have outages in certain areas uh, next time and we can, we can submit those preparatory items, those prophylactic items for, for reimbursement to FEMA, so long as they're narrowly scoped uh, to prevent additional or to mitigate risks for future emergencies. Okay, good. Those are the things that I wanted to hear you say, um, because we realized what, where our shortfalls were in this. And so if anything that we can do from any of the monies, whether it be the FEMA money, if it comes through infrastructure, whatever, we need it all. So that we can we can shore up our weak spots. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I have a question on the next informal report, uh, 218 on McLennan County Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Uh, for I guess this is a question for Ms. Hudnell and for Mr. Price. Um, 
knowing that we have that, what is it, $7.7 .7 million, um, what do you think is the disconnect with um, getting all of this money out? Do you think it's, I saw that we hired some temporary staff. Do you think it's getting the word out? Do you think it's uh, people actually meeting the eligibility? Also, if y'all could just briefly go over the eligibility so we all have this on our radar and can share with our constituents. Uh, but curious how, how we can um, really take advantage of this 7.7 .7 million that we have access to right now. Yes, yeah, so we have been reevaluating our program to see how we can extend our marketing efforts. And so we have put together a marketing plan. Um, mm -hmm. And but also, uh, there is difficulty um, trying to um, gain compliance and eligibility for the program. And so we do have our case uh, eligibility specialists um, working with our clients to demonstrate a hardship. As you know, that is one of the main factors to demonstrate a hardship for the, uh, the rental assistance. As if 2020 or 2021 wasn't a universal hardship. <laughs> but the team is diligently working with uh, the clients to, to make them eligible. Okay. But we have sufficient staffing um, to process all of the applications. It's, it's really just making sure people are eligible and then getting them in the pipeline. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. That's true. Uh, I mean, I'll just uh, follow up uh, uh, Council Member Palmer there with yeah, 7.7 .7 million and then the, we put out just under 200,000. And there is, um, and I know we're doing all we can and we're kind of early in the process and, and trying to uh, get our footing uh, here to to uh, get this money out to the people that need it. Uh, and I'm, I'm certain that there are a lot of people in Waco that can use this funding. Um, is there... Uh, a, a, I like the idea here too that we're talked about in the in the in the, the uh, supporting materials about the marketing efforts that we are putting in place. Um, they just whatever we can do to get this money out. I think we need to. I don't know how much latitude we have to change the conditions of being of eligibility. It's probably a pretty tight uh, 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 scope. But if there's anything we can do locally to to help get more people involved, uh, uh, I'm all for it. But Rainey, if you have any comment on that. Yes. So what we have been doing, we have been working with the Justice of the Peace, and we have been contacting landlords because they have the ability to apply as well for that for their tenants. Um, also, I would like to update those numbers. Um, when we first did the IR, the numbers were roughly 182,000, uh, but now we're at 239,000. Great. Great. Thanks, Renisha. Sorry, can I uh, ask a clarifying question off of that? In interacting with the Justice of the Peace, does that mean that when potentially eviction processes are being filed, we're then letting people know, hey, this resource is available, there's money right now? Yes, we are receiving uh, their spreadsheets, and so we're making contact with their landlords. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, thank you. And then the, the um, don't want to cut any off, but I just wanted to say thank you for informal IR 219. I know I asked for this a couple of weeks back. It's exciting to see Waco being opened back up. And I, but I do appreciate staff being very cautious and safe on how we're doing this. And even the outside events that were taking place because they're all outside events, um, making sure that we're still trying to do as much possible social distancing, wearing masks, sanitation, etc. cetera. Um, and so I know that, uh, Parks and Rec have been very busy trying to make sure that we get back, uh, give the city goes back doing some type, type of events that, that our community is used to seeing from us, uh, but they're also being done in a safely manner. So, so thank you for this IR. Yeah, I'll just uh, echo uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sabido on this, because yeah, it's just good to be thinking about, you know, Brazos nights happening again and, I didn't know for sure if we would get on the schedule, but it looks like we are thinking about how we can do it in some form. And just seeing this little list of, of stuff on page 19 of uh, of everything that we've kind of got on deck uh, that we've been missing for so long. We missed a whole year of all of all of these activities. So I appreciate uh, everybody's thought in getting this stuff back in gear uh, and, and thinking ahead. I mean, you got all the way out to Waco uh, Wonderland. So you guys are thinking ahead. I'll give you credit there. Thanks. Um, I mentioned, but I'll just state briefly, I mentioned in our conversation earlier, earlier the, the week, 
Um, of course, we'd love to have you all in, in District 1 at Brazos Park East. I want you to um, give considerable consideration to what that parking looks like. And we will have to have a, a, a very strategic, well-communicated plan um, and how we're going to move people, because I know that space, while it's perfect, perfect venue for it, especially in the new spacing um, design plan that we have for our um, our COVID restrictions, it, it's parking that is is going to take. I mean, but I know between our transportation system and our parks and rec staff, something will be worked out, and there will be a, like a regular shuttle flow or whatever. But um, we just have to really make sure that we communicate that properly. Uh, I'll just wrap up by saying these are some, this is a lot of great information um, and um, shows a lot of the strategic work and the scope and breadth of work that's going on at the city right now um, to really try to proactively respond and address to the, a lot of different things coming up. So I, I appreciate the staff for this good information and appreciate the questions and, and comments that uh, have come in as a result um, of, uh, of these reports. Um, it, it really is a mark um of a diligent staff um and a and a diligent council i want to commend this council too for requesting these informal reports um and seeking this information as we move forward um on on uh, this this uh this breadth of important information so thanks bradley thanks mayor and council we um we do have eight public hearings on the agenda today uh, the first is a public hearing for a project within tax increment financing district one to support the renovation of a 2,500 square foot building on 8th street. Um, and then the other seven public hearings are uh, that we'll, we'll hear more about those in the planning uh, work session here in a moment. Clint Peters, our director of development services will we'll review those. We I'm have council. I'm sorry, Bradley just oh, wanted to yeah. mention for the record that council member or Mayor Meek, Customers Board of Root and Palmer have filed affidavits of substantial interest for 2021-224, that first public hearing. Thanks, City Secretary. The, um, we have 14 resolutions on the agenda today, as well as five ordinances on the agenda today. And each of those five ordinances is on for a second reading. And if there's no questions further, that concludes my report. Thank you, Bradley. Um, are there any items that the council would like to remove from the consent agenda? Mayor and council, I know that we have to pull um, two resolutions from the consent agenda. Resolution 232 is being pulled because we have a registered speaker for this afternoon. And resolution 244 um, is pulled uh, because it'll need a special language when making a motion on that item. Very good. Any other resolutions? All right, the consent agenda will include resolutions 2021 232 through 2021 245, with the exceptions of 232 and 244. I'll now ask City Manager Bradley Ford to introduce the first work session. You're muted, Bradley. That's that's the first time that's happened in a while, right? At least in a week. Oh, um, no, our first work session is uh, our discussion of planning public hearing agenda items will be led by Clint Peters, our director of development services. Clint. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. Uh, we do have uh, seven planning items. Let me get the screen pulled up. Uh, the first one is a uh, special permit request for a short term rental type two at 4613 Cole Avenue uh, from Jeff Bird on behalf of a Jeff S. Bird Properties LLC. Uh, this is a short term rental type two, um, which means it is a single family uh, residence uh, that uh, rents out to one um, group at a time and the owners are not on site at time of rental. Uh, this is in our um, Heart of Texas Neighborhood Association uh, between uh, Bosque Boulevard and uh, Lake Air, just south of uh, the Extraco Event Center uh, in that little residential neighborhood that's tucked in there. Uh, single family home that's zoned R1B zoning. Um, you can see it's all mainly single family zoning there. There is a, a single family residential PUD uh, near there. 
Um, there are not any other um, SDRs within 500 feet uh, of this site. You can see there's actually not any on the map. That, uh, so this 500 feet would uh, basically mean this residential area tucked in here uh, would only, this would only be the, the, the SDR um, that could be allowed in that area if approved. Uh, here's the home. It's a three bedroom home that's uh, in the process of being renovated. Uh, it does have uh, uh, parking uh, available. There, there's actually some parking uh, beyond the fence as well. Uh, this um, applicant uh, currently does not have any other STRs that have been uh, licensed. Uh, and we did mail out uh, 32 notices and had uh, zero returned on responses. And Plan Commission did recommend approval of this five vote of eight zero. The next uh, public. Oh, sorry. Clint, can I ask you uh, sure. real quick on, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the good work you're doing and trying to get a path forward with our short-term rental uh, ordinances and all that. Um, and, and all of your good work shepherding uh, development services as well. Are, when these applicants have, have come in, do they have a sense uh, that especially for short-term rental R1B type two, uh, that there's no guarantee that these may be approved? Yes, we, we do. Uh, and that's not just for special permits, but for anything that has to go through a public hearing process and be acted on by the plan commissioner council, we, we do let them know the process and what, you know, staff's recommendation means, what plan commission recommend, recommendation means, but ultimately it's a city council decision on these. Okay. Do, do they, do the applicants in your experience have some sense of the history on these types or, or not necessarily? Uh, it, it depends. Again, we try to educate as much as we can. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I think that's mixed on, um, on whether these are, are, are people that have had experience in the business or this is their first time operating sure. one. Okay. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. You're, you're welcome. Uh, the, the next one, uh, 226, is a uh, again another STR type two. Plan, going, going back to the previous one, did yes, any sir. did any of the were there any um, it, does this round of short term rentals uh, applications were um, um, not just owners but occupants sent notices? No, so th this um, that's a good question because th this um, the the cases from this meeting and last meeting. Um, were uh, originally notified in uh, the March timeframe before we started doing that. We've actually just sent out the notices for the April plan commission meeting where we started doing that. But this, this will be the last uh, set of cases that you see that did not, uh, notices only got sent to the owners of the property. Okay. Um, did any of the, did we have any opposition to this one? No, sir, there was no opposition okay. out of uh, 32 notices. That's great, thank you. Hey, hey, Clint, so just to clarify, we have started sending the notices to not only the homeowners, but the occupants of the homes, correct? Correct. Uh, starting, so the, the cases that y'all will see in May uh, that are going to the plan commission next week, the April plan commission cases, uh, we sent a, a notice to the owners of the property uh, per, per McLennan County Appraisal District. And then if there was a, uh, obviously if it's vacant, vacant property, we didn't send notices to those addresses. But if there was a, a, a home, uh, we sent a notice to the actual physical address for that as well. Thank you. I, I didn't know we had started doing that already, but thank you so much for, for spearheading that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the, the next one, 226, is uh, 1309 Holly Vista Street. Uh, this is a, a single family home in our uh, Kendrick neighborhood, uh, located along Holly Vista in between Memorial Drive and Spate. Uh, that green area up on the map is uh, where the blue line is, is our city limits between uh, Waco and, and Beverly Hills. Uh, this, uh, again, is in a single family zoning uh, neighborhood. Uh, no other SDRs uh, in, the, in the vicinity of the property. Uh, again, another home that's been recently renovated. Um, no opposition on this one. We mailed out uh, 24 notices uh, on this one and uh, 
Planning Commission recommended by a vote of seven to one. Uh, and then the, the last uh, special permit for STR is uh, an STR one uh, at 2901 Homan Avenue. Uh, a, a type one is, is, is a single family or a two family property um, where they rent out to um, one, one group at a time and the owner does live on site. Th this one is a little bit unique because uh, this property is uh, zoned single family, uh, but there's actually a, a, a legal non-conforming duplex on, on the lot. Uh, that was uh, built um, uh, you know, before the zoning was there. So it, it is a, a non-conforming uh, uh, single family or duplex on single family zoning property, uh, which the ordinance does allow um, for type ones. If, and so the owners live on one side of the duplex and they're proposing to rent out the other side of the duplex. And so it does qualify for SDR one, even though it's not a single family structure. And this is in our, um, Dean Island neighborhood at the corner of 29th and, and Homan. Um, single family zoning, like I said, this uh, it is a duplex on the property, but it is single family zoning. Uh, and you can see here, um, because it's uh, an STR one, the, the 500 foot buffer requirements from other STRs does not apply. And so there are some other STR twos in the area, um, but uh, that the buffer does not apply for STR ones and actually uh, the STR um, at 27th and Ethel that's here is, um, is owned and operated by this applicant. So they, um, they actually live uh, in, in this home here that uh, is part of this application, uh, but they also have this STR here that's within a block of it, two blocks of it. Um, here's the house, it, you know, from the front, it does look like a single family home, but you can see on the side uh, where at some point this was divided up into two units and there, that's the door. Uh, for the second unit. So there's a, a two, two, two bedroom units and they live in the front part of the house and, and propose to rent out the, the back unit there. Um, we uh, received, uh, we mailed out uh, 24 notices on this one and we, uh, we got one returned uh, in support of it. And, and as I mentioned, they do operate another STR2 at 2700. Ethel that uh, was a, a granted by the city council in January of 2020. And uh, we have not received any complaints on that one uh, to date. Um, the next public hearing at 228 is a voluntary annexation. Uh, this is a, actually associated with one of the second readings uh, on the ordinance. Uh, this is a, a three acre, a little over three acre uh, tract of land at the corner of uh, Texas Central uh, and Bagby, as a little donut hole in our city limits, um, they are proposing uh, to, to annex it and then zone it for C2 to have a, a little commercial uh, node there uh, in the middle of the Texas Central Industrial Park uh, to serve that area out there. Uh, and the Plan Commission does recommend approval of that one eight to zero. Uh, the next public hearing 229 is a rezoning for uh, three properties at uh, 2215 and 2217 Washington Avenue uh, from C2 to 03. That's about half acre. Three, like I said, three, three lots that make up about a half an acre. Um, these are three existing single family homes that are being renovated in uh, the mixed use area between downtown and the uh, residential portion of Austin Avenue Neighborhood Association along uh, Washington Avenue. And that, er that area is designated in our land use plan to be mixed use flex. So it is a, a mixed use area, um, uh, mostly uh, office, some limited commercial and, and, and residentials in that area. Uh, and then you can see the zoning is mixed too. You have uh, quite a bit of O2 zoning uh, uh, and then C2, which is property is currently zoned as that pink color. And then the 03, uh, which is being proposed, is this uh, purplish color that is uh, adjacent to it and behind it. Uh, the difference, differences between C2 and 03, uh, C2 is more of a commercial district uh, where you would have general retail, uh, restaurants, um, offices, uh, other commercial uses, uh, and also it allows uh, for uh, multifamily density uh, complexes. 
Uh, 03 is a more limited uh, mixed use district. It does uh, have um, allow limited commercial uses uh, and office uses, and then some uh, low intensity residential uses, uh, single family duplexes. Uh, we okay, did with uh, this one. Oh, go ahead. Can I ask a couple of clarifying questions? Sure. So with this one, it's currently out of alignment with what it needs to be zoned because those are single family homes currently, right? Correct, um, and here's here's a picture of that. So there, the 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 three houses here are the, the mm -hmm. properties uh, in question, and uh, the the actual existing zoning uh, C two does not allow um, single family residences by right. Um, these are they're they're legal, what's considered legal nonconforming, uh, because we um, before 1986 we had cumulative zoning. So if you had commercial zoning or industrial zoning, you, you could do anything by right all the way down to a single family house. Okay. Uh, and then and, and then 1986, um, the city adopted a new zoning ordinance um, that went more to use based zoning districts, but the a lot of the especially a lot of the inner city, the zoning did not get changed on individual property. So you have a especially single family residences, you have a lot of that that are in commercial zoning districts that were um, you know, uh, in conformance with the zoning ordinance at the time, but the zoning ordinance changed, so they're considered legal, legal non conforming. The, the house, um, there's three houses. One was built in the 30s, and then these two others were built, uh, I believe, in 1979. So all three of them were built in conformance with the zoning ordinance at the time. So, yeah, so this change does bring the, the homes into conformance with the current zoning ordinance. Okay. And then with with this proposed change, these could either stay single family homes and then be in conformance, or there's a possibility that all three of them, one or all three could become STRs? Cor correct. So that the O3 would um, allow them to be single family, uh, long, you know, owner occupied long term rental or uh, short term rental or other uses allowed in O3, which uh, could be an office use, a limited commercial you know, subject to meeting all the other development standards for those uses. Okay, and we we didn't receive anything from the Austin Avenue Neighborhood Association? No, ma'am, no response. Okay. Awesome, thanks, Cliff. Sure. Well, I should probably know this, but as it's currently designated as C2, and, and if it gets changed to O3, from a short-term rental perspective, is there any difference between C2 and O3 from, short, from a short-term rental perspective? Yes, because uh, because C2 does not allow single family by right, the, the single family STRs uh, are not included in C2, but you could do in C2, you can do multifamily short term rentals. So, ba so basically, currently, you could do multifamily short term rentals on these properties, changing it to 03 would, uh, you know, take it down to where you could just do the, uh, the, the single family and duplex short term rentals. Okay, thanks. And the plan commission did recommend uh, approval of this by a vote of uh, eight to zero. Uh, the next request is a, a, a another rezoning uh, to O3, but this time from R1B to O3 uh, at 710 East Park Street. Uh, this is um, six um, lots that are um, on the corner of Park and uh, Waco Drive uh, in East Waco in the Northeast uh, Riverside Neighborhood Association. Um, the, the land use designation for this one is Office Industrial Flex. This is that uh, area that's is bounded by uh, Waco Drive, Highway 84, I-35, and then Business 77. And uh, when we adopted the, the future land use plan with a comprehensive plan, the idea was, you know, this could be an area potentially that uh, could uh, be a, a a, a job creator, you know, as it redevelops and transitions that could provide uh, a place for jobs and other uh, services for the um, East Waco area. And so that's that's why that whole area is designated uh, for office industrial uh, land use designation. Um, this area is made up predominantly of vacant lots and there are um, some single family homes in there. Um, that this area, that the area I've talked about that's bounded by those three highways is about 35 acres. Uh, and I, I counted about 35 homes. So it, it's, it's, it's a pretty um, 
low um, density as far as development. Most of that area is, is vacant property. Um, the 03 zoning does fit in with that land use designation, that proposed office industrial flex land use designation. And because it is, you know, it has frontage on the frontage road of uh, Highway 84, uh, staff and the plan commission thought that that was a good uh, option for zoning there. Uh, you know, there, there, there are some potential other zoning districts that could, could be a little bit more in, in, intense, but uh, because this area is still predominantly single family, we feel like the 03 zoning made the most sense there because it, it does provide the most protection other than residential zoning and is the most compatible zoning district uh, with single family residential. Uh, here's a picture of the property. This is looking from the frontage road uh, here. It, it's a vacant property and then looking back uh, along East Park uh, Drive towards Highway 84. Um, we did get um, out of uh, uh, 25 notices, we did get two uh, back, one um, with concerns uh, from um, actually one of the, uh, a, a long-term uh, resident of that area that lives on Johnson Street. Uh, th their concern was that, um, you know, if the, if the zoning would negatively impact um, their neighborhood, they would be opposed to it. And if it didn't, they're okay with it. Uh, and then the other one uh, was actually opposition to it. And, and again, the, the main concern was about uh, compatibility with that residential area. Uh, Plan Commission did uh, recommend approval by a vote of eight to zero. Um, hey, Clint. Um, so I'm, I want to talk this through because I, I have some concerns myself. Um, I get, you know, that uh, now the land use um, designation, when was that, when was that set? How? It, it was adopted as part of our uh, comprehensive plan in 2016. Okay. Um, and even I was just having a conversation with a separate organization about, uh, uh, you know, plans and how they go and if they're still applicable to where we are in place at this time. Um, I have some concerns mainly because um, while I get the the thought process of making that um, office industrial flex, right? Um, I don't know that in 2016 we could have prepared for where we are now as far as bringing in incentivizing major corporations where we are, you know, and, and that we do need residences, you know, that we are, we're short on residences. And my concern is, is while that is, you know, was, was stated in the plan, and I get it because it's, you know, flush in between three major uh, thoroughfares, but, you know, that property has been residential as far as we know in its entirety. Um, could it not be again? I, yeah. we, we, you're, you're right. And we, we struggled with this one. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, originally the, the applicant did um, apply for a different zoning district um, mm -hmm. that did not meet the plan uh and and you know we we, we told them we, we wouldn't recommend it uh, mm -hmm. not only because it didn't meet the plan but our concerns about how it could impact that that single family neighborhood uh and you know uh, another part of the the plan for that area is the mm -hmm. you know the reworking of those highways and mm -hmm. uh you know taking you know eventually the the highway 84 corridor and that bridge section are going to have to be replaced and the plan through that corridor study is to take all that back down the grade where you would have more uh, connect connectivity in the area and it, it would make it more uh, attractive for whatever kind of development, whether it be industrial or residential. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, that, I mean, that this, this area could, you know, it's got, it's got a, a street grid and it's got utilities and it, it could uh, be developed as a, a little pocket residential area as well. It, it, you know, especially when you start um, improving the 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 arterials around this and making mm -hmm. them more, you know, compatible with residential. But uh, because I, if you if you would go back quickly to the uh, street view, um, uh huh. Um, 
Because if it's 35 acres, I know in 35 acres, you could make a little community, couldn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, 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 the concern we had, is, you know, because this is, most of this property is, um, you know, there's not, there's, uh, it's not like it's all one owner. There's, sure, it's, sure. You know, it's a little pieces, you know, there, sure. you know, a lot of them are single family, but there's, I mean, there's some of the vacant land is being consolidated by, you can, mm -hmm. you can tell mm -hmm. in the appraisal district that investors are buying chunks of those lands. But, um, you know, when we got the request and it, and it, and it was a zoning district that fit the land use plan, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we felt like, and, and especially that, is a zoning district that is compatible, you know, or, or can be compatible with single family neighborhoods. Um, you know, mm -hmm. 03 is the zoning we use and in, in, um, around single family neighborhoods, we, we felt like it was a, appropriate to recommend approval, but yeah, but yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's no, I, and yeah. I hear you and I understand how plan commission could have come to that. I, I, I don't agree. I would really like to press pause on this and ask for a continuance because I think we need to look deeper into this and um, cause you know, you know, with, with it being 03, there are a whole lot of possibilities that it could be. That's right. You know, and, and it, it, it just, it, it makes it a little too loose for me. Um, especially when, you know, there, there were, I think I saw, I mean, uh, one was, you know, a, a clear concern about what this could potentially do to their, their neighborhood. Um, and the other was, yeah, if we know what it is, then we can decide, but we don't know what it is. And it could be a whole lot of stuff. And so right. I, I just, I don't, I don't feel comfortable right now making a decision on this today, especially not when I really think it would behoove us to go uh, make a deeper dive into, into this area. And, you know, knowing what we know today that we didn't know in 2016, about what our needs of our community are, knowing what we know today about the position of where the city of Waco is on our housing crisis, all of those things that we know today, I would rather we wait to make this decision because I don't think we can answer it appropriately today. And uh, I would be supportive of that too. And just maybe as a future agenda item, I know Bradley has discussed and I know other assistant city managers have discussed um, a ver variety of um, housing opportunities, and, uh, a, a, a more implementing house housing strategies um, from both rehab to core re uh, redevelopment. Um, and again, future agenda item might be worthwhile to um, really explore um, wh what it would look like to put some carrots in, um, in place, some incentives in place to really kind of build out and the residential communities that uh, Council Member Bearfield is talking about. Uh, this is Holmes, um, and I share um, Council Member Bearfield's uh, observations on this. I, I think the bar needs to be really high anytime we, anytime we rezone something that's already zoned uh, residential. So if, uh, I, I would be in favor of taking more time on this one and looking at it too, just to to. Uh, to see what 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 the options are here, because uh, again, uh, we are we are looking at you know housing stock. We're looking at uh, housing prices going through the roof, and we I think we want to preserve the uh, the uh, the zoning where we can. And you know, and maybe as we take a longer look at this one, it makes sense to switch it. But I would like to have a little more time to look at this one. Uh, I echo my council member sentiments, and I love the idea, Mayor Meek, of having this be a future work session, especially with where we are in the budget process. Um, if we potentially are going to put some extra funding towards housing rehabilitation or incentives for developers to build in the core of the city and take advantage of land like this, like council member Bearfield said, I think this feels like it's the right time. It just feels like we have this convergence of housing stock issues and the denigration of those, this increase in STRs, this lack of um, affordable housing. And it feels like we're at this precipice where we need to make some pretty strong decisions, both along policy and funding lines going forward and getting us all on the same page and prioritizing that I think would be incredibly helpful for us as a group. Yeah, I, I guess I would, I would just say, you know, we, we have a request for rezoning in front of us. I, I, you know, unless we're, if, if I'm understanding you right, wanting to take a pause and continue in this case, we would have to continue it to some certain meeting. 
or or take some sort of action on this request. I, I don't. Um, we we can't continue it indefinitely. So I we would need to have some sort of, uh, you know, if, if we take action to continue it, it would need to be to some certain date, council meeting date. Okay, so I, I guess that would be on you because when um, having a conversation or discussion, because I was like, if I'm asked to vote on it today, my answer is no. So I, that's fine. I mean, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, I mean, I, <laughs> Yeah, but I, just, I mean, I, I I would need to know how long it would take for you know you to um, for us to have a discussion about it. I mean, I you know because again, the land use plan was something that was created. I mean, you all worked to that, um, and you know. So what I'm asking is, what does a pivot from your original um, recommendation look like? I mean, is it something that you know when you sit down, you be like, you know what? Councilmember Bearfield, I, I, I just don't agree. I mean, and that's something that, you know, only you could tell me how long that would take. Sure. Well, I, I, I think I think what you're asking for to, to do, you know, basically an update to an area on a land use plan is, is a, a, a pretty long process. If the concern, mm -hmm. if the concern is, is about the impact this has on potential residential development, you know, my recommendation would be to, you know, turn this case down and, and mm -hmm. you know, okay move from there. I mean, it, uh, I, I just, I just don't, I, it's hard to put a timetable on that for a specific zoning case. I got you. Uh, I, I appreciate it, that clarity. Yeah. And if that's, if that's the, you know, if that's the concern of the council, you know, to me, a, you know, a, 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 a denial uh, and then, you know, letting them come back and, you know, because, because basically if you turn this down, they can't come with the same request for a year. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, within a year, you know, we, we, we probably will There'll have be enough clarity. time. Yeah. Yeah. On awesome. Uh, and, and then if there's another zoning request that makes sense in the interim, there, there's that opportunity. But uh, if, if the concern about 03 is there, um, you know, I, I would, I would encourage the council to just make a decision on the request that's on the table today. I appreciate that clarity. Thank you, Clint. Sure. Uh, and then our, our last, Public hearing is an abandonment request, uh, public hearing 231. This is a, a request by Walker Partners on behalf of uh, Baylor University for abandonment of, of Dutton Avenue. Uh, this is the, the section of Dutton between University Parks and uh, South 4th Street, uh, right, right at the front of their campus. Uh, th this section of Dutton, it's about three and a half acres uh, was actually a, a tech stock controlled roadway um, that uh, was turned back to the city uh, in, in 2017 with a, a couple of other roadways that uh, uh, really weren't, uh, didn't make sense to be on the, the state uh, uh, highway network and were turned back to the city. Uh, and now Baylor has come to us uh, and request the city to abandon this right away as part of their uh, their campus expansion project. They, they own all the land. Uh, between Dutton and I-35, between 4th and University Parks that uh, includes their Mark uh, and Paula Heard uh, Welcome Center and some other lands that they're wanting to expand uh, the campus. And um, currently that section of Dutton is a four lane divided uh, boulevard section that's really wide and uh, you know not, not really pedestrian friendly uh, to cross the street uh, for, for uh, pedestrians or bikes. So they're wanting to repurpose that section of Dutton uh, to, to have more of a, a campus feel like they do on the internal streets and campus and um, and provide better connectivity with future expansion of their campus. So uh, we staff and plan commission uh, recommended approval of this. Um, there are um, considerable utilities in there and we'll need to retain easements. Uh, and then um, not only Baylor, but city staff and plan commission felt like there needed to be some sort of connectivity uh, through there uh, between South Forth and U Parks. And so there's a condition on there uh, to, to keep some sort of access through there. Uh, you know, it can be it can be narrowed down, but it needs to still have some access through there. And uh, Baylor agreed with those uh, uh, recommendations, conditions. And uh, Plan Commission recommended by a vote of eight to zero for approval of that. And uh, that's all, oh, yes sir. Uh, yeah, uh, Holmes here on the, on this one. Yeah, I'm glad we can work with with our partners, Baylor University over there, and uh, let and, and 
the welcome center evidently will be going in right there and i think they'll have a, a nice uh, a nice plan around uh, around this and they can uh, uh have this land to make it more productive for their for their plan so I'm, I'm happy we can work with them to to uh, make the highest and best use out of this tract And that concludes my report, Mayor. Thank you, Clint. Uh, what do we got next, Bradley? Next up, we have our second work session, which is a discussion of proposed neighborhood grant program, which I'm really excited to hear uh, from our team on. The City Council has heard a couple of updates from the Office of Neighborhood Engagement over the last few months. And uh, as a reminder to the public, we, you know, the City Council made a a real priority out of reinvigorating the neighborhood program in last year's budget. We're starting to see that work really take root and, and green shoots popping up all over town. Today's presentation will focus in on the development and um, discussions around the neighborhood grant program, which is really a central part of the neighborhood engagement process. Millette Harrison, our director of neighborhood engagement will be leading that discussion and I'll turn the, the microphone over to her now. Thank you, Bradley. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Let me attempt to share my screen. Are we seeing the neighborhood grant program slides? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. <laughs> Uh, Millette Harrison with the Office of Neighborhood Engagement and as Bradley mentioned, I am here today to talk to you about our proposed new neighborhood grant program. Um, Waco has not had this type of program before, so in our effort to create uh, the neighborhood grant program, we first did some research uh, looking at various other cities uh, that had the program, a similar program. We also surveyed our neighborhood associations to see what they might need. Um, so in this presentation, I'll go over some of the research, that process, uh, also provide you an overview of the proposed grant program, plus the timeline for uh, how we hope to get this program going. Um, as I typically do and have before, I want to just remind you that there are some differences between neighborhood associations and homeowners associations. Um, neighborhood engagement for Waco works solely with neighborhood associations, which are more voluntary and informal groups. Homeowners associations are more formal, mandatory membership, mandatory dues. And I bring that up only because as we reviewed some of the other cities, they sometimes work with both. And so I wanted you to just have a quick refresher on that um, before we proceed. So. In our research, uh, we really sought to find programs that we thought might work well here in Waco. Uh, we didn't want to duplicate other existing programs uh, that work well, like Waco Foundation's immediate impact grants, which are focused on our core neighborhoods. Um, but not many of our peer cities have neighborhood engagement type programs. Um, as a matter of fact, only two have neighborhood grant programs, College Station and Denton. Now, we did look at those. Um, but we also then obviously looked beyond our peer cities for some other cities that might have programs um, that we could learn from. I would like to give a special thanks to the cities of Arlington, Pasadena, and Plano, who not only shared some information with us, but spent time on calls to discuss their programs, some of the pros and cons of doing it the way they do, some of their lessons learned, and really appreciate uh, their staff to spend the time with us to kind of give us some advice as we embark on this journey. Um, I will say the most noticeable difference between many of the other neighborhood uh, grant programs that we found and um, is that they do work with HOAs um, and whereas Waco does not. So in most specifically, their HOAs tend to have a much higher capacity to make a match for a grant program. So they have, you know, more significant funding structure so they can they can match a grant uh, program that the city might offer. So given the fact that the city's focus, uh, Waco's focus is working only with neighborhood associations, we have attempted to create a grant program that will really work well for Waco specifically and its neighborhood associations and, and 
to make sure we don't allow a neighborhood grant match to prevent the program from working well. So on this slide and the following, there's just a review of some of the cities that we looked at. Um, and uh, just so you have a, a map of the chart here, the cities are listed on the left-hand side, the different groups that they work with, the projects um, that they focus on, if they have a specific kind of project they focus on, their maximum funding levels here in this next to last column, and then the match that they require in the last column on the right. So as I mentioned, Arlington, Plano, and Pasadena were really nice to talk to us. So they're listed here first. Um, and what you see is very, <laughs> Different cities do it different ways, so I don't believe there's any right way. I believe you keep uh, tailoring the project until you get one that works well for your community. Um, and I, I would mention that obviously they have different funding levels. Uh, Plano has, or Arlington has, uh, different levels for neighborhood associations, which are informal versus homeowner associations, which are formal. Plano has a kind of a two level beautification grant a small and large piece. And they also created a mini grant because many of their most uh, informal groups, their na voluntary neighborhood groups, couldn't um, come up with the grant required, the match required for the grants for the beautification grant program. So they embarked on doing something with zero match with some of the things that we actually do already provide. So communications, printing, yard signs, and, and such like that. Um, Switching over to some of the other cities that we've looked at, I'd just like to point out varying sizes, varying locations, but um, Houston, Denton, DeSoto, and even one from Arizona. We did look outside Texas, but focused on Texas cities. Houston and DeSoto requiring a 100% match, um, Denton only 25%, and then Arizona at 0% match, and then the varying grant max funding levels of $10,000 and down for this particular group. So we surveyed those cities, we talked to them, but we also thought it was really important. We were structuring a neighborhood grant program for our neighborhood associations to ask them <laughs> what they thought. So that's what we did. We asked them to prioritize um, community improvement efforts that they would like to see in their neighborhoods. What were, you know, you know, what were their areas of concern? And we gave them a hypothetical of, if you had $4,000 to spend on the grant, what would you do for your neighborhood? What's important? Um, and then also very important question of what their capacity is to match the grant. Those uh, surveys went out on February 22nd and we're due back March 5th. Um, we did get back 14 different neighborhood association responses to that. So pretty good response from our groups that are active. Um, and they did go out online, mail, English, Spanish, um, all the parameters that we could try to make sure we were achieving maximum results on our survey. Um, so uh, in the survey itself, we had some structured questions where we provided lists or categories to prioritize or choose from, and we provided some open-ended uh, items as well. So this is one of the structured questions that we sent out, just prioritizing their community improvements. So we gave this list of resources, beautification projects, etc. You'll notice that a lot of things are rated either highest priority or high priority. That's the orange colors of all those different things that we ask them to provide priority to. Leading um, in responses are park amenities and increased membership, but that is certainly followed closely um, by resources, beautification projects, <laughs> security equipment, and community events. So a lot of high responses, high priority, and highest priority for this group. In one of the open-ended questions that we asked was the straight up, if you had $4,000 grant, what would you spend it on? What would, you, what would be your priority grant project? So the responses uh, that we got, the seven top responses that we got dealt with more lighting, new uh, or updated signage, some traffic control, security equipment, having events, and some infrastructure improvements. And uh, startup was specifically, they wanted some startup funds and they wanted uh, funding for like printing materials, food or other meeting supply items that would help uh, encourage folks to attend meetings. And then also mentioned were consultants, 
park, park structures. Education was specifically about doing programs with schools or projects with a school in their neighborhood, uh, website development and some other equipment and supplies. So asking the neighborhoods um, if they were given a grant uh, that required a match, you know, what would their ability be to, to meet that requirement for match? And the responses are here. Uh, donations, volunteers leading with, you know, most of them saying they would, they could not make a cash match, but six did say they could provide some level of cash match. Um, but of all those six, none could do it entirely with cash. It would have to be some combination of cash and, and donations or volunteer time, depending on the project. So all of that information from other cities and our neighborhood associations that we asked uh, lead us to uh, the basic program that we propose to you today. So we believe we should establish a neighborhood grant program that has the purpose of providing financial assistance to neighborhood associations for beautification projects, identification projects, and just community-based projects that have a public purpose and do a public good. We are recommending a matching or a maximum grant amount uh, of up to seven thousand five hundred dollars so seventy five hundred dollar grant amount um, and we are recommending that there be a a match requirement of 25 percent um, that could involve cash or in-kind donations uh, volunteer hours however uh, something unique that we are proposing that since we know that some of our projects will be largely city oriented and ultimately be something that's publicly owned or maintained by the city, uh, such as replacing signs in the right of way, like those neighborhood identity signs or a new park bench, those types of things. Uh, we would not be requiring the 25% match on those items. We would still require the neighborhood input, the application, certainly if they're creating maybe a new logo or graphics for signage, they would have to be involved, but it wouldn't require the 25% cash or donation match. Um, we are also proposing um, uh, the first grant cycle have application process open April 21st through May 28th. So that would um, start very soon. <laughs> um, but that would give the neighborhoods a little over a month to you know, come together as a group, decide on a project, um, and then complete the application. So potential projects that we expect we might see, although we have no, uh, you know, no way to know what they're all thinking at this moment, but there are uh, lots of the things that we expect we might. So events, gatherings, maybe a big national night out party, that sort of thing, some park amenities or improvements, um, security equipment, beautification projects, community gardens, um, and neighborhood identity. And we have some examples of the neighborhood identity signs here the top right of the screen there, you see some of our existing signs that you'll see out in the neighborhoods. And the middle photo at the bottom also is the West Waco sign, actually on a pole out in the neighborhood. Um, they have the opportunity to either create those if they don't have them already, or maybe update them if they would like to redesign their graphics and put out new signs. There's also the option of this bottom right photo shows a sign topper which we don't have here in Waco, but they do have in a lot of other communities that would just put a, an identification for a neighborhood on top of an existing intersection sign, street signs. So um, just to help identifying the neighborhood, identifying the area. This is certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, it's just sort of a, a starting point to encourage some ideas. Um, but in general, it's very broad, what can be an eligible project. So it must do the following things, support neighborhood goals, be highly visible and accessible from the public, uh, have a community benefit, enlist community participation and support. And by community participation and support, we mean people signing that they support that. We have actually have a petition in the application um, that requires at least five signatures. We would like to see more because we would really like to see the neighborhood agree that they're supporting this project. Um, it should result in some enhancement of the neighborhood. It should be feasible to complete within six months and it certainly should be inside Waco city limits. <laughs> Likewise, things that aren't eligible, 
would be something that duplicates um, or expands on an existing program or service. Um, it would also we would, it would not be eligible if people asked to support an operating budget for some ongoing service. It cannot conflict with city policy. It should not conflict with the neighborhood association goals. Um, projects that could negatively affect a neighborhood or other neighborhoods, um, something that's going to exceed six months to completion, or, and this isn't important for this round, but in future rounds, maintenance of projects that were built with previous grants. So if they something's going to have maintenance, they need to figure that out and how to account for it um, in the initial application process. So um, as with any government program, there are uh, always going to be rules that we must follow, but um, based on the research we did and uh, the neighborhoods that we know here, we feel like the neighborhood grant program that we have some basic rules that most neighborhoods really should be able to follow fairly easily and some things they might not have, but we can assist them uh, in getting if they're if they do not have them. So they must have bylaws. They need to have articles of incorporation filed with the Secretary of State. Their membership should be open to everybody living within their boundaries. They need to have been actively holding meetings for the past year. You will see an asterisk there. Um, obviously, we have a COVID exception written into this particular uh, or anything that would be well outside their control. Um, but in general, we would want the active neighborhood associations who have been meeting and have been doing uh, work on behalf of their neighborhoods to be able to be the ones that can apply for a grant. Um, federal tax ID, have a bank account in the neighborhood's name, and then some very basics like apply by the deadline, agree to submit the progress and final reports, and be a City of Waco Neighborhood Association. So um, all the programs that we researched were the grant payments were made on a reimbursement basis. And for the ones that had either very well-funded neighborhood associations or HOAs, um, they actually got approved for the project, they did the project, paid for the project, and then got reimbursed. What we know is that won't work well for a lot of our groups. They do not have that kind of bank account where they can float a large project. So for the, we still will do a funding re on the reimbursement basis. Um, that's uh, we need to have the structure set up that way because there might be small grants that that works quite well or there may be more well-funded neighborhoods that, that will work quite well but um, since most neighborhoods that we're aware of might not have the, the funds to float a large project or pieces large pieces of a project we'll have the ability to set up payments directly from the city to the vendor so it will not be the neighborhood paying for something and waiting on reimbursement from the city. We, we can set up some of those payments directly. We've seen other cities do that. It seems to work well, and we think that would be a good uh, option to keep the grants going. Um, again, I just mentioned a maximum grant of 7,500, and just in case you're, some of you have already done the math in your head, but a 25% match uh, of the $7,500 maximum grant is 1,875. Um, which could provide a total value um, of over $9,000 for the project. Um, we have a selection committee that we're recommending. It really is made up of people from what we consider sort of high touch departments, departments that are out in the neighborhoods in various capacities all the time. So someone from public works, parks and recreation, police, community services, solid waste and then neighborhood engagement staff. Uh, we'd really like to thank these particular individuals for volunteering to be on our first group of the selection committee. This, this group will score independently and then come together and, and score collectively to make a recommendation to the city manager for the projects that we believe should get funded. So um, if council approves a program that we have designed and are proposing today, we are prepared to conduct what we call a parallel process of finalizing the grant policy with city council and allowing the initial application period to be opened up so the neighborhoods can start thinking about their projects and working on their ideas for their applications. That would mean, um, and we're 
we are teed up to do this, but not without council blessing. <laughs> but we are okay to go. We have the ability to go live tomorrow on the web page with application information. We have tentatively already scheduled uh, meetings with the neighborhood leaders, three different meetings on uh, Thursday, one Zoom and two in person where we can all be spread out appropriately to just go over the program, the application process, and all the things they would need to fill out uh, to submit an application. But before any of that results in applications turned in, we would be back to City Council on your very next meeting at May 4th um, for the actual grant policy approval, where you will see the entire guidelines. Um, then much later in the month, the applications would be due from the neighborhoods for consideration. We would have the grant committee uh, meet uh, by mid-June, hopefully a little bit sooner. Um, and then applications, the, those would be recommended the city manager for approval. We would enter into contracts, get notice, get contracts done, notices to proceed, and then start on the projects. So hopefully start on the projects mid to late July and be able to, for most of them, wrap up the projects by December. This time frame of July to December would not be something we strive for in future rounds. We would want to be much more fiscal year concurrent with the fiscal year, but we really would like, uh, if possible, to get this grant program going for this fiscal year. Um, and so having a little bit of an overlap and then knowing that soon after our fiscal year begins in October 1, we would actually start another round of applications, uh, funding uh, dependent. Uh, but to, to keep it going in, in fiscal years and future, future grant awards. Uh, we will be trying to tighten up the city's review pieces as best we can. Um, we're following the models of the other people and what they recommended, but we will look for ways to, to modify this to the better as we learn uh, in the first few rounds. With that, I would be happy to open it up to questions or, or and thank you for your time. Well, this is just fantastic. And this PowerPoint is so beautiful. I'm loving all of the graphics and just the flow of information is stunning. Um, I love this and love the just thoughtful consideration that you and Rolando took into the best practices of other cities and thinking through what this looks like specifically in Waco. I think this just sounds like it's has a lot of exciting opportunities. A few questions that I have. So I've managed some grants with a match capacity uh, previously, and we've used that um, the national rate for volunteer hours. So I just looked it up while you were giving the presentation. And right now a national uh, volunteer hour is around 27 dollars and 20 cents so that would be 69 volunteer hours for uh to hit that match component could um neighborhood association meetings and board meetings and planning could those hours be captured in a match component or would it need to be just in the like if you're building some sort of a structure is it just in the actual execution of the project we do have a uh an allowance proposed for that for the there will be some planning uh, let me be back up not for the application process so submitting the application would not count as volunteer hours but for some of the planning meetings that occur we do have the allowance for volunteer hours to account to occur there um okay. now it would be as a collective so it would be hours of the board or hours of the membership body 15 people for one hour or three people for one hour, it would count as an hour. We have, um, that was one of the suggestions we got for some other cities to not just um, base it on actual individual hours. We okay. also have proposed a, a starting match rate of $15 per hour. Um, the rates were all over the board. There were a few cities that did use this national rate there were several that used less than $15. And we thought, um, well, I, maybe I'm matching it too much on my economic development you know, uh, previous life. Um, but we felt like that was a, a good matching hourly rate right now. Uh, and we do feel like that might transition up over time as also we might actually give larger grants over time. Um, but we are certainly open to y'all's recommendations on 
$27 an hour or, or whatever the matching rate might be, we allowed it to be for individuals 15 and over. Okay. okay. My, just my little personal flag I would wave there is I would love to see this at that national rate since that rate changes every year. And that just gives us a really solid benchmark for us to work from, um, particularly just because that 69, if, if we're going to not count group hours, I think it's going to take a lot of effort in order to track all of those hours for a group that uh, is rich in time, but maybe um, has less abundance in the cash donation piece. Um, a couple of other questions or thoughts is for something like the neighborhood identity project, I love the idea of us having updated signs. Um, I think from a visual perspective, my preference would be for, uh, for the city to hire one designer and then work across all the neighborhood associations. So we have cohesive branding that is reflective of each of the neighborhoods, um, but still, yeah, there's still that level of cohesion, whether you are in North Waco, South Waco, East Waco. Um, so I don't love the idea of doing the neighborhood identity projects kind of siloed across um, specific neighborhoods or specific districts. And my last question is with the city lights, is there any other um, avenue for residents to request city lights? This that just seems like a basic city amenity to me um, that seems kind of odd in a situation like this. Yes, ma'am, there, there is a, a regular process for folks to create, to request additional street lights. Um, it is a little bit of a process. Um, it requires the people, uh, it, the block has to be, like if it's mid block or, the, or at an intersection, it has to be spaced a certain amount from other existing lights. Um, so yeah. you can't just get them side by side. The people at the intersection or at the mid block range have to agree that they want a light. So okay. this is a little petition process and then somebody has to agree for it to be in their yard. So there are minor things that have to be achieved. Um, but there is a process for that that we work through our public works uh, traffic department uh, that to get additional street lights. Now, that is works really well predominantly in the older neighborhoods of the core of the city where there are wooden poles and regular street lights. As you get into newer subdivisions with underground, that it's a whole different animal and it's the cost is not easy to achieve. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Those are all of my questions. Hey, Millette, thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Uh, I am excited to see this grant program kicked off. I know this is something that um, I know the neighborhood associations will appreciate. Uh, and, and so thank you for putting much thought into this. And I'm excited to see this uh, program launch from, from the city of Waco. I just think anything that we can do to support our neighborhood associations is a plus and they greatly appreciate it. So thank you, first and foremost, I would like to begin by that. Um, I do have a few questions about the program and just um, maybe I missed it during the presentation, but I just wanna make sure that um, I'm understanding it correctly. So will this grant program be an annual program that we do every year with neighborhood associations? That is what we are anticipating. Uh, I know when city manager Ford announced this um, funding for this in this fiscal year, it was anticipated that there would be subsequent years, but certainly that's a council decision. I, I just get to anticipate or hope. I don't get to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I would love to see it on, on an annual basis. I was just making sure that it was not just for this fiscal year. Um, that staff's recommendation would be to have this type of program every single year for neighborhood associations. Yes, sir. The other question I had, I know you made mention in some of the other cities that um, use this grant program for neighborhood associations or HOAs, but we are, or staff is just recommend, recommending neighborhood associations for the city of Waco, correct? Yes, sir. That is who we do work with and that is who we've traditionally okay. worked with. I just, if anyone was watching the presentation, I didn't want them to get the impression that we were doing, we HOAs would qualify for this type of grant program as well. So yes, that's sir. why I was asking. Just neighborhood um, Yes, ma'am. Um, now I'm assuming that the neighborhood associations, uh, they would apply online on the city's website. Yes, sir. We have created an online application form that's sort of a survey form based. 
Uh, we have it in English and Spanish. If they have issues with the online form, we can we can provide a, a paper copy for them to do. Um, but we really are trying to make it be an online based application um, system. And and how detailed is the application process? Let me ask that. Um, it needs to have a certain level of detail. It needs to be a, a fairly well thought out project and specifically a realistic budget. Um, mm -hmm. So these are city funds. So we will we will need to have and we can help them with this some, but there, there need to be, you know, some quotes or some bids, depending on the price amount that city funds are spent on um, that would help them solidify their budgets. There will be some planning that does need to go into this. The application itself is is not is not gruesome. It is not a lot of questions, but there are some attachments like the budget, um, say like a, a landscape plan if they're wanting to do some sort of a bed or something like that. There need to be some attachments that go with it um, that show that it's a you know a well thought out project, whatever that may be, and that may even just mm -hmm. be an event. But how they plan to do it and execute it, and um, if it's something like prices of signs or that sort of thing, we would certainly engage with that to make sure we're getting bids from vendors at the, the type of material that we want and those sorts of things. Sure. Well, and, and the reason I ask that, I, and while I, I definitely agree that there needs to be some type of uh, details to the application process, I, what I don't want it to happen is that it becomes so uh, convoluted or so complicated that neighborhood associations just say, you know what, forget it, and we're not even going to apply for it, and then it really defeats the whole purpose of the, of the grant program, you know, I want the program to be successful, and so as we begin to more for, move forward with the application, I think we should evaluate that and make sure that, you know, that the same type of persons working on the application we take into consideration from the different neighborhood associations, um, and knowing that we are also working with volunteers of the neighborhood, you know, and, and the reason I ask that is because not the same scenario, but there's some grants that we've applied for, you know, personal grants for other organizations and uh, the process is tedious and long and very lengthy and at times you just want to say, forget it, this is not even worth it. So I don't want that to happen. In this case, that's why I was asking that question. Yes, sir. And I wholeheartedly agree having been on both ends of that <laughs> um, grant process as well. Uh, there are some forms and some things that have to be done for this, but we city staff are here to help them uh, with questions that they have along the way. It's not a an abandonment process where it's we're, we're just trying to be a gotcha on the other end. We can answer questions. We will be trying to walk them through what all of it means on the front end um, mm -hmm. and then be available for individual meetings if they need them during the application process. Um, there, there is a certain amount of formality that just kind of has to come with city dollars, um, but we don't sure. want to make it a hurdle that nobody can get over. Wonderful. And and in that same spirit, I think it would be great that after we go through year one, that we really do like a post session reevaluation of how the first year went, tweaks that we can make to make it better, maybe some feedback from those that receive grants or those that apply for grants but didn't receive any money and just really try to make the process better. I think that that would definitely help us get sharper as we move forward in the next couple of years um, while really making this program successful. Yes, sir. And we we would be very open to the input and, and feedback from the neighborhood associations. And we would certainly, if you're hearing anything differently than what we're hearing, we would love to hear that as well, because we, we do know there's going to be some tweaking to this to get it sure. uh, to what it needs to be, but um, we are certainly open to that and, and, and we'll be making improvements as we know they need to be made. Wonderful, thank you. And then the other only last question that I had is, I do appreciate um, the option, you know, the grant is a reimbursement, but there's an option there that, that the city can pay directly to the vendor. And one of the requirements is that the neighborhood association has a federal tax identification number. Do you know how many of our actual neighborhood associations have that? I don't know how many. I know a few do, um, but it is a fairly easy process um, to get one. 
And that will be really one of the things that we need uh, along with the W-9 for the city to actually make a payment to them. So it's, it's a pretty on, easy online application. Um, and once they have their bylaws and articles of corporation, it's pretty easy to get. So we will help them through that process if they don't okay. have it already. Perfect. I, I, I just don't want any obstacle. I mean, I know it's try to alleviate as many as possible and, and I get there will be some hiccups along the road. I completely understand that. And please also know that I appreciate the um, tenacity that staff has had in making this program work and thinking of all of the obstacles or even all of the objections. So I do appreciate you in that. I do want to make it as easy as possible for our neighborhood association. Yes, and thank you, Mike. I'm just going to for that. really quick and say to keep us on on schedule for all that we need to accomplish today. We we have about three to five more minutes on this presentation, um, and so if so, council members have you know I know this is something that we're all very passionate about and and want to uh, speak on. So uh, I'll just encourage council members who have uh, more questions to jump in here. But also, if you have really detailed questions, don't hesitate um, to email uh, uh, city management. Um, about those questions um, um, and continue to uh, uh, make sure that they'll make sure those detailed questions get answered. So just, I'm just trying to keep us on track, um, but please, please carry on um, on this uh, for the next few minutes. Hector, are you finished? Councilman Sabito, yeah. or yeah. Mayor Pro Tem Sabito. Okay, I'll just, just 30 seconds on mine. Uh, uh, I appreciate, and uh, council, you know, for the last couple of years has really been, uh, asking you to get this going and i'm just so happy to see uh city management and millette you know jumping on the uh, on the task here to create this engagement initiative and, th and this grant program is just fantastic so it's uh, uh our, our our prayers have been answered here on helping out neighborhood associations because i think it's such a, a valuable structure for councilmen to uh, i don't think i've missed a neighborhood association meeting and i've got several established ones west highway 84 uh, Landon Branch, uh, Cedar Ridge, and you know a new one that we just created in the last couple of years with uh, China Spring, and then uh, a brand new one that Millette has helped. Uh, just the last week, we had one of the initial meetings at uh, at Mountain View. Uh, so, and it takes a lot of determination and a lot of uh, commitment for for uh, these local neighborhood associations to keep going. So, I appreciate everybody's uh, work uh, that does uh, that, that volunteers and uh, really the feedback is just tremendous at all these meetings. Um, uh, and I'm in very much in favor of this, uh, this, uh, grant program and, uh, let's get it launched as quickly as we can. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. If, if I might, I would just say, and thank you also very much. So to Rolando Rodriguez, who is my teammate here in neighborhood engagement, he's, a, he was a great help in helping me get this to you, um, making the presentation look great. So I just want to yeah. give a shout out. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Millette. We really appreciate this and we're excited for where we're headed. Thank you. All right, Mayor and Council, our um, final staff work session of the afternoon is work session 2021-2222, uh, which is a discussion of a comprehensive plan, master plan study for the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame and Museum. We'll be joined by uh, our esteemed director, Byron Johnson, as well as uh, Matthew Wheeler from Jack Rouse and Associates. And this is a, a report to the council um, based on an action you took back in March 2020 to really take a kind of a comprehensive look at the Ranger Hall of Fame, including our, our mission and structure and, and also what the future might hold in terms of facility improvements, as well as ensuring the Ranger Hall of Fame tells the full history and comprehensive history of the Rangers. And I look forward for them to present their findings to you, Council, and I'll uh, welcome Byron Johnson to the screen. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mayor Meek, Council members, City Manager Ford, and staff. Um, I met most of you, I think, in person over the last uh, year. My name is Byron Johnson, and I've been honored to serve as the director of the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame and Museum since 1996. We are grateful to have the time to present a synopsis of work done on a, yes, we have. 
uh, on a comprehensive plan. The Hall of Fame and Museum has been a successful partnership of the state of Texas and the city of Waco for, believe it or not, 57 years. We hope to provide a basis for discussion about the renovation of the facility and, and the future of this Waco asset. I am joined today by Matthew Wheeler, who is the project manager from our consulting contractor, Jack Rouse and Associates of Cincinnati. He represents five internationally respected firms who spent about seven months working with our staff on this study. They examined every aspect of the department and drafted recommendations to assure its continued service and relevance. Next slide, please. Um, what is the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame and Museum? It's a historic preservation, educational, and heritage tourism partnership between the city and the state of Texas. It is legislatively designated as a state museum. The Hall of Fame portion is designated as a state memorial. The library and archives and the collections uh, of the museum are designated a state repository, and we also serve as the headquarters of Company F Texas Rangers that deals with major criminal investigations from just south of Dallas all the way to south of San Antonio. Uh, it was also, interestingly enough, the first law enforcement historical center in the United States. Next, please. What does it represent? The Texas Rangers are the oldest statewide protective and investigative law enforcement agency in the United States. They've served 200 years under five flags from their founding of, under the government of Mexico in 1823 to the US. They have been called the best known historical symbol of Texas after the Alamo and they're recognized worldwide in law enforcement in US history in commerce with hundreds of products being named after them from jet bell jet helicopter ranger helicopters on down to entertainment next please what is its value to the city and the state stakeholders that's really an important question next please since the museum opened its doors in 1968, it's had an estimated 4.5 million cumulative visitors. If you put this in real terms, it would fill up McLean Stadium almost 100 times. Uh, it has brought in an estimated between 120 and $170 million in tourism revenue over that period of time. Um, it serves as prestige for Waco as the trustee of a state historical legacy. And it also preserves and displays artifacts, facilitates historical research, and provides multiple services to the state, such as the Ranger headquarters that we host here at no cost. Next, please. What's its perceived value outside of Waco? Well, the, the, the shadow it casts is a little bit bigger than the institution. Uh, almost every time around, we wind up on Travel Advisor. Uh, Money Magazine has noticed us. We usually rake in, within the top 10 museums in the state of Texas, uh, in Texas highways. Uh, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of references to the museum that are extremely positive, and we think a, an aid that diversifies the tourism industry in Waco. Next, please. Why did we start this study and dialogue? Next. One of the things we need to do is avoid obsolescence. Uh, the museum itself, the core museum building was built for 20,000 visitors. The last year before COVID, we had almost 100,000 people come through the museum, which is five times what it was planned for. Um, we must modernize and update the exhibits. With the dialogue about law enforcement and whatnot this year, it's very important that as, as uh, City Manager Ford said, we tell all sides of the story. But we only have in reality a little bit over five to 6,000 square feet of usable exhibit space in this, in this building. Um, we have to assure that we remain relevant we have to guarantee that we are factual and honest and balanced in the portrayal of the evolution of the Rangers toward their ideal of protecting the people of Texas. 
The other thing we want to do is preserve Waco's trusteeship of the museum, sustaining its three state authorizations given to the city by the state and the privileges and benefits that we've just discussed that accrue to the city by having the museum here. Next, please. I'm going to turn it over to Matthew now, who uh, headed up the study that these five firms did, and let him uh, go into the details on this. Matthew, if you would, please. Thanks, Byron. And uh, thank you, Mayor, Council, and, uh, and Byron, Texas Rangers Hall of Fame Museum, for inviting me today. Um, our consultants team was made up of uh, five different firms. And the reason why we structured it that way was to give a complete report. Um, some of our selected portfolio projects include the Washington Monument, um, Kennedy Space Center and Space Center Houston. Uh, our teams worked on 9-11 Memorial Museum, um, Holocaust Museum, National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, uh, commercial projects such as the World of Coca-Cola, uh, American Museum of Natural History, and, and even the Dallas Art Museum. The goals for this, for this project, for, for the team inclusive, was, a, was really a five-year plan, a master plan for five years. And that was, from the start, a complete and comprehensive study of the facilities, the operations, capacity, resources, and revenues, including expenses. It was a physical plan. It included uh, fundraising. It included a market analysis and an economic potential uh, in terms of feasibility for the renovation. So with all five firms, we were able to do that and give, give you the city a complete report in terms of this master plan. Our goal from the start was to assure an accurate, truthful, and equitable exhibits and program to the enhanced facility. Um, it's a spectrum of renovation options. You'll see three physical planning options today that we that we worked on with the team. And it's it's also sustaining a capital fundraising program. So th given that this is a five-year master plan, and our recommendation is that, um, that includes creating a development office to launch a three-year capital campaign. Uh, that coincides uh, ideally with the 200th year anniversary of the Texas Rangers. Um, and it can work towards the Texas State Legislative, the 88th legislative session in 2023. So as that happens, fundraising, uh, renovation, construction, the proposed opening is set for 2026 in our recommendation. So the strength of the, of the asset, the Texas Rangers themselves, I mean, you know you're internationally respected. Um, you rank you rank up there with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Scotland Yard, and Interpol. Um, and, and because of that, and because of working with the Texas Rangers Hall of Fame and museum staff, we know that that they are we superior. I mean, we it was a joy to work with them. And and quite honestly, they've they've provided award-winning programming with some quite honestly, limited resources. Uh, their staff averages 13 years. Most have master's degrees. Several have more than 30 years in the field. And, and we don't see that, quite honestly, very often. Um, the work is respected. It's studied for, it, it's been studied for the new $45 million U.S. Marshals Museum and $103 million U.S. National Law Enforcement Museum. So our key findings, this section really delves into, into that specific area. Our focus of the story was really uh, a recommendation of an immersive visitor experience that's accurate, candid, very candid, direct in terms of history. We all know that we need to, to work on that. Um, it's, it's a story of how the Texas Rangers core duty has evolved to an ideal of protecting all of the people of Texas. Um, and the story is one that's both of achievements and service, as well as lessons learned from the failures of individuals and administrations. So honestly, uh, very early on, we, we spent a lot of time in positioning of this message and the goals 
of the new master plan. And, and at its core, really, uh, the core of the, of the Texas Ranger Hall and Field Museum is a mission to continue and address diversity and integration. It's something that resounded from before we even put pencil to paper and started working on the master plan. And it starts with a story and honestly a goal. And that is what we all work towards. So in terms of potential, the Texas Rangers Hall of Fame Museum, as you know, was Waco's first tourist attraction. Of the four and a half million people who've attended, there's approximately 85% of tourists, and we found 15% are area residents. Uh, beginning in 2015, museum staff, with their initiatives and the popularity of the commercial Magnolia market, increased attendance by 37%. So that meant there was a five-year period of uh, 465,000 guests who, had, who uh, visited the, the museum and visitor center. Um, we know that Waco is a destination getaway with the nine new hotel and the new riverfront development that's underway. Um, we know that this will provide diversity of unique and quality attractions and it assures an interest as tastes change. In terms of unrealized potential, before Magnolia, which was the catalyst project of, of Waco, gate attendance was sold, was really declining. And it was at a slow decline at a rate of one and a half percent a year, uh, really due to obsolescence and content and delivery of that material. Um, larger Texas, Texas museums with probably less popular uh, brands or less popular material uh, average 180,000 visitors annually. And history is known, and we, we know this through museums and attractions, that, that programs, if they're not reinvested, they, they become antiquated. And quite frankly, obsolescence leads to, over time to, uh, to a deteriorating market. So investing in one of the three scenarios that we're going to present today, we estimate would see an estimated attendance increase of between seven to thirty-four percent. And it's important to note that while while museums will benefit from growth, as as this has from from Magnolia, uh, and as as growth in resident market increases over time, both the penetration rate and attractions weight rates will still decline if the content is not updated. So it's important to note that reinvestment allows museums to keep pace with, as we talked about earlier, audience expectations, uh, subject matter, and cultural experiences. The facilities. The core buildings are an average of 46 years old. They were inexpensively built, a wood frame structure for the most part. Traffic flow uh, is an issue and, and uh, the Hall of Fame building has structural and building system issues. However, there were $500,000 in TIF funds con uh, contributed to develop the research center and $900,000 in bond funds for the Knox Center. 80% uh, of the complex was privately or state funded. So it was designed, as you know, in the 1960s for 20,000 guests, as, as Byron mentioned. Uh, Pre-COVID, that was almost 100,000 guests per year. Um, issues with the facility operations are storage and exhibit space of artifacts and archives is at a 90% capacity. We found that office space and work areas, as well as parking areas, are extremely limited. Um, and guest and public amenities, such as restrooms, are woefully undersized, especially for groups and school groups. In terms of our key findings in international, uh, internal operations and staffing, uh, adjustments for inflation, the average operating budget has largely been static or decreased for the museum over the past 20 years. Uh, some essential fun functions were, have been limited to a single staff person um, and, and many times with no backup to that, to that individual position. Uh, staff numbers have been unchanged for over a decade, but in attendance and programs have increased. 
Uh, there is a drastic need for an exhibit manager, uh, development division, and clerical staff. Um, and it's important to note that while staff costs will expand in, in this master plan, the recommended redevelopment scenario um, are expected to lower the subsidies from the city uh, for, from the uh, average historic levels. In terms of public operations and staffing, um, the adult ticket price is $4.57 less than the regional average of $12.57. So there's room for increase there. Um, there's room for additional revenue. And quite frankly, we found that the reason being that increases were rare due to limited visitor experiences and amenities within the museum. And quite frankly, a desire not to outprice local families and school groups from the market. So our, our scenario also examined the possibility of reallocating the Knox Center as an exhibit space and theater space rather than uh, a capital cost uh, and as a, a high maintenance and rental space. And then last, lastly, uh, retail operations desperately needs to be relocated uh, physically in the, in the plan and it needs to be expanded uh, with provisions made to permit to uh, permit online commerce. The per caps per guest are not bad, but uh, relocation physically changing the space and adding uh, this online commerce element would increase dramatically the revenue. So in this, in this plan, you will, see, um, you will see the existing, my laser pointer here, you'll see the existing current floor plan. This entire, floor plan, the facility um, represents 34,000 square feet. It's comprised of really, really five separate buildings. On the left, moving left and clockwise, the Hall of Fame area is, is the area that has some structural issues, building leaks, et cetera, foundational problems. The Knox Center is in blue at the, at the top of the plan um, with, uh, some restrooms and guest amenities for kitchen. Up to the right is the current entrance to the museum and office space in the oldest part of the, of the museum itself. And then the research center is in purple here, um, which was the newest addition. The, the red areas that you see in the current plan indicate the gallery space. Um, so as you can see, there's, there's a compression of space, there's flow issues, um, retail is all the way over here, away from entrance, and um, there's very little lobby space. This one restroom here serves the guests as school groups enter, or they, they enter and they go down to this area, use this restroom, and then come back to meet the school group to start the tour. Um, there are three plans we're presenting today and that are in the, in the decks that you'll see, receive as hard copies. There's a modest, intermediate, and transformational plan. In this modest uh, plan, uh, it, it is a cost of 23.5 million by our estimation. Of that, the building is roughly 13.5 million, exhibits is 6.1, and we're holding a contingency of 3.9 million for this plan. In this model, this model enhances the visitor experience and the exhibits, which would be upgraded. It improves amenities, but it doesn't solve the key issues of the outdated exhibit area and buildings that are becoming obsolete. What it does do is, again, looking left here, we've consolidated gallery space and changed the Hall of Fame area into an exhibit space. So reconfigured that, we are recommending the changeover of the Knox Banquet Facility to exhibit space and adding a theater, which would be an entry theater. So this would be a looping theater. It could uh, provide content, uh, rental space, but actually giving over more space of the museum and better utilizing the banquet space for gallery space in this plan. You'll see that we've relocated retail, uh, retail offices, have been added in retail storage as well as 
online order, mail order, are now all located here closer to the entrance. We've expanded the restrooms, consolidated some of the office space, added uh, front of house ticketing operations, security, first aid, all of the necessary uh, necessary uh, operations that, that are duly needed. And then added a school groups room where they can gather and uh, school groups, small groups can collect before they're dispersed. Um, the big thing in this plan is for that school group and for those, those groups is expanding that restroom. And then down in the purple area, you'll see that we've expanded the archives to give some more archive growth because of that 90% capacity. And then um, collections offices and workshop are all this light green that are that currently exist in this location. Uh, uh, the back of house staff restrooms and uh, loading area are all located there. The intermediate plan is a plan which is has a cost of 41.6 million, 22.7 of that are the building renovations and, and new building construction. 12 million are exhibits and 6.9 is in a contingency. In this model, what this does is uh, on the left, we would actually re recommend raising the existing Hall of Fame building and replacing it with a two-story building which would be in this, this location where it exists because we are limited in terms of how, how far we can expand on this property. But what we would do is we would relocate the entrance between the research center and this new building, add exit retail, add all the ticketing group sales and amenities up front, add a retail storage and add school group meeting area in that new building, as well as elevator, and a new uh, collection storage area and dock with a, with a freight elevator for use upstairs. What this plan does not do is build out the second level. So the second, while the second level would be built, the exhibitry and the, and the um, public guest space would not be utilized. The second level would only be utilized to raise the artifacts in a collection up out of the floodplain and get those up to an upper level. It, uh, it would build in, but not fit out future restrooms, um, obviously elevators and a, and a balcony area. It's, this plan still accommodates uh, a change to uh, converting the gallery space of the Knox uh, Banquet Hall and utilizing that for theater space. Um, it expands the Ida Tub Hall and Homer Garrison Galleries uh, and, and corrects uh, some traffic flow operational issues through the core horizontally of the museum. Uh, it still expands the front office space uh, or consolidates the office space and expands those restrooms. And what we've done is, is taken over a larger area for collections and storage that is adjacent and immediately uh, to the right of the entry. Um, so, so this whole purple area now would become storage, uh, expanded archives, and research center. And in the, the, the next plan, the difference is not that much different. Uh, it's a $45.6 million plan. Um, and the difference is uh, you say, why is there not much difference between the 41.6 and the 45.6 uh, million dollar version is the difference in this plan is really that the second level would be completely fit out and open to the staff. So that would be a new exhibit space that would be open uh, balcony to the Brazos River in the, in the front um, and a, a complete fit out of the entire facility. This reconfiguration, as you see in the transformational option, represents a total area of gross area of 56,000 square feet from the 34,000 square feet. So as you see, it does a lot of, a lot of physical change to the, to the building and a lot of operational change that, that um, enhances the guest experiences, all the exhibits, and quite honestly, the, the function of the, of the, of the museum. And visitor center. This is an exterior rendering. 
of that two-story space uh, here on the far left that would sit exactly where the Hall of Fame building now sits. The research center would be adjoining and is the building right in the center. And then the original building on the far right, which would house um, uh, offices and staff, uh, staff work areas. This is an entry uh, rendering of the first floor um, of that new, new building. Uh, with a relocated entrance to that new side between the research center and this building. This is an exhibit uh, that you that really is the first exhibit you encounter. It's, it's what we call Meet a Texas Ranger. And it's a completely different type of exhibit. It's media-based, it is current, it's contemporary, and it's interactive. So it becomes much more immersive than, than artifacts in history. While that's still a part of this museum, this is the first experience that really engages the guest and, and they're really able to, to explore and interact and see and, and understand what current Texas Rangers do every day. So future exhibits would be off to the right here. Uh, this overlooks the Brazos River to the left and the retail is just to the extreme left here beyond this left-hand side of this column. Uh, as an exit, experience, uh, exit area of retail directly into this uh, entry lobby. So with that, there's obviously development and capital campaign recommendations. And we knew that this was what we had to establish and implement. So that is, it's, it's multiple, uh, it's multifold, it's multiple levels, but it's to build a philanthropic development and infrastructure. And that means that we need to create an internal development division. We need to establish a general membership program and we need to launch an upper level giving program. Um, that includes implementing corporate um, foundation and planned giving programs. And it's really developing a whole slate of annual giving opportunities for the museum over time. Um, and this, as I mentioned, this capital campaign may, may be a three year campaign but to have it coincide with the 200th year anniversary um, is just, it, it's, this, won't, this opportunity won't happen again. So that's ideal uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, capital campaign and fundraising. Challenges and opportunities regarding that are, we know that we need to take advantage of the Texas Rangers Bicentennial. Um, that's in 2023. And also the legislative session, the 88th legislation, latest legislative session. Um, we need to gradually diversify revenue by adding uh, private sector and corporate foundational support uh, to the city and its earned income. Uh, and honestly, quite honestly, we need to correct a widespread misconception that the city can continue funding and earning you know, the, the museum with earned income alone. Um, the, the, you know, when we know that the the future needs of the museum are, are, are great. Um, so we know that we need to secure wider financial, financial participation by state, uh, by the Texas Ranger Association, Association Foundation, and also um, uh, you know, as, a, as a return for the half century of services and support that they provided the city. So in summary, when you get right down to the boots, I love this image. Uh, in, in 1964, Waco became the trustee of the state of this state symbol. Uh, and, and it's the Texas Rangers Hall of Fame Museum is really an irreplaceable asset in terms of recognition, uh, prestige, the heritage, tourism, and, and tourist dollars. Uh, so to avoid creeping obsolescence and, and to remain relevant and viable, uh, the museum will require public, state, and private reinvestment. This reinvestment, while significant, we feel is a small fraction of what the historical, historical center has contributed over the last half century or can contribute in the future. And with that, I will say thank you very much. Thank you so much, Byron. Uh, any questions um, for Byron or staff at this time? 
uh, this helps. I don't have any questions per se, but I uh, just have some notes written down here. Let me see if I can make my way through it. Uh, Byron, I appreciate this presentation. Um, we've had a lot of challenges. We thought I-35 was going to be the big challenge for the next you know, the, the two or three years. Uh, and we didn't see COVID coming where it was going to shut down the whole thing. So I appreciate your perseverance through through all of this and keeping the keeping the museum uh, active and, and uh, nice trends here again and kind of as we see the end of the tunnel here with COVID. Um, I like the vision we're talking about and I like sticking with the protecting people of Texas and uh, really getting telling more of the history and, and, and expanding on that and some of the challenges that have been in there and also just the the the, the great story of, of, of the history of the Texas Rangers and also the contemporary part of it, I think, is, is a great idea on, on what, it, what it looks like today and getting people more interactive with that. I think it's a great idea. Um, uh, you've got to update content. I get that. And we had the same issue with the zoo uh, a couple of years ago where we, we did get some bonding around that and get new exhibits in there. So uh, I, I, I totally get what we're talking about here on, on trying to, to uh, keep, the, keep the museum fresh. Um, so anyway, it's a it's an ambitious goal here of getting this all done in the next uh, by 2023. But uh, let's let's I'll stay tuned. Let's see what we've got here. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. All right, Bradley. What? Sorry, everybody. That's uh, Mayor Council. That's all the presentations from staff today. I think all we have left is a call for future agenda items. Are there any future agenda items? <laughs> I do have one. Um, I have been keeping up with the uptick in car burglaries and break-ins, especially in the South Waco area, uh, Kendrick, Baylor, Alta Vista neighborhood. I would like a follow-up um, how we are handling that situation, um, recommendations that we can give to, especially to my constituency since uh, a lot of those neighborhoods are in, are in South Waco, um, and, and maybe even as to reasoning why these are happening. So I would just like a follow-up report on that, please. I'd echo that, uh, what Mayor Pro Tem said in terms of uh, the kind of the other side of Kendrick, past Loop 340, uh, Sendero Springs has also seen a significant uptick as well as car, in car burglaries and some auto theft as well. So I, I would also be interested in that. Thank you. Any other future agenda items? All right, we will um, recess into executive session as read into the record by the city secretary. Notice is hereby given the city council will go into executive session in accordance with the following provisions. One, attorney briefing, text up and meetings act section 551.071, possible dispute with video service providers regarding franchise fees. Two, real property, text up and meetings act section 551.072. Three, Economic Development, Texas Open Meetings Act, Section 551.087, and four, Personnel, Texas Open Meetings Act, Section 551.074, City Attorney Jennifer Ritchie. We are now in executive session at 4.08 p.m. <laughs>